Why did Jesus have to die on a cross? <laughs> Haven't you ever asked that question? And if it's salvation, how does it work? Have you ever asked that question? I read a story about a young soldier in World War II who jumped in a foxhole just ahead of a bunch of bullets zinging over his head. He immediately tried to, you know, deepen the hole for protection. As he's frantically digging in the dirt, he uncovers this little piece of metal. Lo and behold, it's a silver crucifix left behind by the former resident of that very same foxhole. When all of a sudden, another figure comes flying into the foxhole. It lands beside him. Uh, when he has a chance to look, he realizes that it's a military chaplain and so he holds up the crucifix and he just gasps, oh, I'm so glad to see you. How do you work this thing? <laughs> Ironically, that's what the law, the knowledge of good and evil is all about, right? How do we work this God thing? It's an awful lot like asking how does this thing work and the answer to that question is called an atonement theory. Atonement literally means at one -ment. It refers to what a priest would do in the temple, and it also refers to the covering on top of the ark between the cherubim, you know, kind of like the tree was between the cherubim, where the glory of God would manifest and issue his judgments. He would issue his judgments on the caparet, the atonement seat. This is uh, Luis Burkhoff's systematic uh, theology. This was kind of the, the gold standard for Reformed Protestant seminary students when I went to seminary back in the ancient, the late Pleistocene. I've scoured two chapters of this book. The first one that I scoured was called The Nature of the Atonement, and the second one, Divergent Theories of the atonement. In the first chapter I scoured, Burkhoff argues that there's really only one correct theory of the atonement, the penal substitutionary theory of the atonement. That's the one that we used at youth group. And that's the one that most American Christians think is the only one that there is. As far as I can tell, the development of it started with Augustine, what we talked about last time, because he argued that God is mercy, that's unconditional love, right? And yet God is also this other thing, an opposite thing called justice, which he defined uh, as retribution, the opposite of mercy. It's getting what you deserve, justice. But what could a created being possibly deserve anything with that had not already been given to them. Justice is not getting what we deserve, for if it were, there would be no justice. Justice is not getting what we deserve. Justice is God getting what God deserves. At the end of the 11th century, Anselm, the Roman Catholic Bishop of Canterbury, he, he promoted the satisfaction theory of the atonement. It's the idea that the sin of Adam dishonored, Christ, or dishonored God and the obedience of Christ honored God. So God will not have to endlessly dishonor you for having dishonored him if you accept that Jesus honored him for you by, you know, like joining the church and getting baptized and all this stuff. He seemed to think that God had some sort of wounded ego. As if God were proud and he just couldn't bear being humble. In the 16th century, the reformers, Luther and Calvin, uh, refined what's now known as the penal substitutionary theory of the atonement. It's the idea that the justice of God, as defined by Augustine, demands satisfaction, and now this is the key point, through punishment. That's where the word penal comes from. So no dirty jokes, it means punishment. So the sacrifices in the temple were an attempt to appease an angry God, uh, to appease an angry God, who took out his anger on sheep and goats by <laughs> consuming them with fire. But those sacrifices were never enough, and our sacrifices could never ever be enough. However, Christ's sacrifice was enough, for God was able to punish him enough. And if we have faith in that, we won't have to suffer that. 
Accepting the payment plan is called faith, according to Calvin and, and Luther. And for Calvin and Luther, it was a gift of grace. Not for all, but for some. For some, because God needs some to endlessly experience wrath in order that others would endlessly praise him for his mercy. mercy. <laughs> so, so, so faith, faith is a gift and yet it's faith in a God that's not one, but two, like a monster. Some of Calvin's followers then came along and said, that's not right, faith is a choice, it's our choice, so God is good. But then you see he's not really God, and he's not really the savior because our own judgment is the savior, which saves us from the judgment of God, which just sucks because it's our own judgment that we need to be saved from. That's called sin. So if you didn't follow all that, that's, that's fine. I'm just saying that either way, Reformed, Arminian, or Catholic, it would seem that God crucified Jesus in order to love you. I think that you would think that I was a monster if I endlessly tortured my firstborn Jonathan so that Elizabeth would be grateful that I did not endlessly torture her. And, and if I said, well, it was Jonathan's choice, you'd say, no, it wasn't. He's just a child. He didn't even know what he was doing. Well, that's the penal substitutionary theory of the atonement. And you see, you can work it. It works great for getting folks to raise their hand at the end of youth group or to donate to the building fund. But it's not so great for helping People trust the heart of God our Father. 